but it's okay to be skeptical. <laughs> okay then. Jim, thank you very much indeed for that. Jim Acosta there. You bet. Well, the role of the media in the your flying saucer phenomenon is a, is a very, very important one. I, I think it's very clear that uh, in the United States, at the very least, that there were efforts uh, during the very earliest days to try to get the media to basically uh, dampen down expectations and dampen down public enthusiasm concerning extraterrestrial life and the flying saucer phenomenon. And this is actually documented. And ever since that, we have seen many, many examples of how the media doesn't really explore or doesn't really investigate flying saucer reports and that uh, various media organs have been brought out uh, by the CIA. For, exa for example, the National Enquirer was actually brought out by a CIA asset who used it as a very clever way to debunk uh, flying saucer reports by basically sens sensationalizing it, making it part of the kind of tabloid media whereby serious media investigators would not do any research into a flying saucer report that had been in any way uh, uh, covered by the National Enquirer or these these tabloids. So that was a very piece, a very clever piece of uh, psychological warfare, in my opinion, to try and get the mass media disinterested in the flying saucer phenomenon. So it's a very, very complex issue, and it, the, the secrecy isn't that hard to maintain if you have this sort of infiltration into major institutions, media, and also the ability simply to float nonsensical s stories out there. Because people hear the word UFO and extraterrestrial, they think somebody from a trailer park in West Virginia who's floated on t board a spacecraft had sex with someone from Mars and claims they have a baby in an incubator or you know just all kinds of nonsense the truth of it is actually more interesting the truth of the technologies and the fact that the extraterrestrial technologies are so advanced that they interface directly with coherent thought like we have coherent light in a laser they have technologies that interface with thought, that interface with conscious mind, uh, that their development of artificial intelligence that's integrated into these spacecraft is so advanced that they pick up on a directed... Uh, it's fascinating. And this is what we've been experimenting with. And the whole paradigm becomes a new paradigm of understanding the structure of the cosmos. But uh, the, most of the information that's out in the public on this issue has been a carnival of silliness. And that keeps most serious people sort of in the closet on it. Is this the reason why so few scientists engage in the UFO subject? The fear of being associated with the silly side of the issue? Is this also why it's never commented on by astronomers or by space organizations such as NASA? Uh, this is not just a simple civilian organization. There's a great military connection here. There's a lot of classified uh, security clearances involved in being able to work at NASA. You can't just stroll in there. So these are people who fit a certain personality profile. That is, they know how to follow orders. They know how to keep their mouth shut and uh, you know, keep their head down and their career will do just fine. That's how most people are in, in, who live in a bureaucratic world. This is how secrets are kept. There are, there are open secrets that are kept for years and years and years because people agree just not to talk about it. And I think uh, that within NASA, this is very likely the case regarding the UFO issue. But like Dr. Edgar Mitchell, people retired from NASA have commented on the issue. Astronaut Gordon Cooper has told the world straight out about encountering a UFO at close range during his flight in the Mercury capsule in 1963. And before he died, he also stated, For many years I have lived with a secret, in a secrecy imposed on all specialists in astronautics. I can now reveal that every day in the USA, our radar instruments capture objects of form and composition unknown to us. I would like to believe that we can invite serious scientists into this arena because uh, it, is, it, it will be changing the paradigm of science as we know it. We know that these craft are not traveling with fossil fuel gas, that there is a technology behind them, that maybe this technology could help the earth and renewable fuels. Uh, if we could get scientists just to use that motivation, 
to look at the technology behind the craft, then maybe we could invite science to um, to come in and change the paradigm of, of, of uh, uh, transportation, of, of electromagnetism, of all these really advanced technologies. But we need to invite them. I think too many are afraid of ridicule. Uh, too many. I have encountered many that are curious but are not willing to go public. Um, so it, we're changing times now, and for the sake of our children, our grandchildren, and the future, some scientists are going to have to take the risk. Well, it's my hope that we open this whole issue up. <clears throat> and as I have said uh, frequently, uh, we're at a point in history where we have to become a part of the neighborhood of ha inhabited planets, uh, rather than like a, like a neighborhood of a community, uh, which we have not even acknowledged that that community exists up until this point. An event with the power to institute a global revolution in technology, communications, energy supply, environmental concerns, and even the way we regard ourselves and our fellow beings. A paradigm shift of unprecedented proportions impacting nearly every part of our existence. Is this what we are facing? And will we have to rewrite our entire human history? In the hollowed halls of national security agencies and the Pentagon, the top military, top security people, the top people know essentially this reality. But the masses of people don't. And the people in authority, the elite, as it were, the uh, power brokers, uh, have desperately tried to keep the lid on this thing because, Terry, it's not simply uh, visitors from another planet or from another star or another galaxy or even another dimension. It's not simply that. It isn't that simple. We've, de -learned, we've learned over the years Several of these intelligences have been involved with us from the beginning of human history. And the evidence has been collected that the human race literally is a hybrid race. And that some of these advanced intelligences from wherever they're from have been involved in genetically manipulating us as a species from the beginning of our history. Man is a hybrid. From a lower order, we've been genetically manipulated by advanced intelligences into what we are. Now that in itself is dynamite, for God's sake. And this brings us to one of the most bizarre sides of this whole issue, the so-called alien abduction syndrome. It first came to public awareness in the early 1970s, when stories began to surface of people being taken on board alien craft after being rendered passive. Incredible stories were revealed, and the remarkable similarities between the stories is what has triggered the interest of researchers. My colleagues and I have heard directly from thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people over the last 20 years about uh, their abduction experiences. And so we know that uh, this is a very, very, very prevalent phenomenon throughout, uh, probably throughout the world. The first thing I recalled was um, seeing three fingers and a thumb on a hand come towards me to pull me out of the van. Uh, I was uh, more than a little frightened. I was quite traumatized by it. I was very awake sitting up and uh, had no reference for this. I was removed from the van. My friend remained asleep beside me. Um, and as I stood at the end of the van, there was um, a being that I could not look at, a very tall what, I, what felt very large and very tall being standing in front of me, but I was not able to raise my head to look up. On each side of me, there was what I've since come to understand is referred to as grays, one on each side of me. My hands were hanging down at my sides, and um, they were, without touching me, with their hands underneath me, they were 
levitating me somehow off the ground, about uh, five or six inches. Um, I was fairly paralyzed, not able to look around. I could look down and see one at each side of me. And uh, we began to move forward. They go through a period where they kind of calm down. They're put on a table. Um, and certain examinations take place, certain procedures. Very often there are areas of skin removed, leaving a little circular scar in, in depth, which you call scoop marks. <clears throat> we don't know what they do with this flesh, but it's taken. And uh, there are often reproductive procedures which involve with men sperm samples being taken and with women needles which go in the abdomen um, or in the vagina, but we believe this has to do with uh, harvesting ova. Fetuses are implanted, little tiny embryos. Fetuses are removed. These are, this is standard material. This is standard stuff. They're taken off the table or taken into another room. They might see a bunch of babies in the other room. They have to hold the baby. Women have to feed the baby sometimes. Uh, uh, they might be taken into a room where they see, well, let me just say that the babies that they see are strange-looking babies. They look sort of like half-human, half-alien. Sometimes they look more human, actually, um, but still odd. Uh, they're taken into a room where they see toddlers sometimes, kids who are maybe two, three, four years old. Uh, who um, uh, are playing with some toys. Uh, they play with the children, uh, play with the toys. The toys are unusual uh, toys. Um, they uh, have these neurological staring procedures with the children who will look into their eyes very closely. They... Uh, might have other procedures where they'll see uh, a room filled with vats, jars, I should say, containers, clear glass or clear plastic or whatever, containers with fetuses in them in different stages of development. Um, they will uh, have all sorts of other procedures that, are, that happen to them. They're then taken back to their normal environment put back where they were on the couch watching the television or whatever and they forget immediately what happened to them. All they know is that they they were watching one television show and not only is that show over but the next two shows are over with as well and they're still sitting there and maybe they still they put the can of beer in their hand they still have the can of beer in their hand and they figure what, what happened? Uh, and then they just forget it. Can't explain it, and they just move on. One person described a drawing of of the, the table. She didn't put anybody on the table, but she described the aliens around the table. The regular little aliens were about her size. She was, I don't know, she was maybe eight or something. But there was this one tall one, hmm. and that's usually the one who's sort of the yeah. one in charge. Drawings of abductors have been made by many abductees where the large eyes and the small cheek seems to be typical characteristics for the so-called gray alien, named after the skin tone. See, one of the interesting things about this is that all the evidence we get confirms the reality of this over and over again. It doesn't disconfirm it. The so-called hybrids, allegedly a blend of human beings and gray aliens, Female, is today uh, reported in a majority of the cases figures. investigated. Alien eyes, but with what oh, the little girl it was the alien, I mean, the hybrid child. The hybrid child. Yeah. And what's interesting, again, the eyes are very peculiar. Yeah. The hair was not combed or brushed and wasn't, didn't really cover the head properly. Okay. And uh, she's one of the mothers. So what said, it seemed to be was that there was a program in, where people were picked up again and again and again as if they had been studied, they were being studied over their lifetimes. 